So today's topic, as you know, is Immunotherapy 101 for multiple myeloma patients. I feel like no matter where you are on your myeloma journey, this is a great topic because even if you're advanced down the line relapsed myeloma or maybe in complete response, maybe newly diagnosed, learning about immunotherapy and where it falls and how it compares to chemotherapy and what constitutes as immunotherapy, what makes it different. It's just such an important part of understanding what myeloma treatment is, what the future of myeloma treatment is, and we can all learn and benefit from this topic today. So as you can tell, I'm really excited to talk about it today. Dr. Holkrantz is back due to popular demand. This time she's going to share with us this crash course in immunotherapy. Um, what makes immunotherapy different? What even is it? Is it going to take over chemotherapy? These are kind of the things that we're going to be discussing today throughout the Q&A and her presentation. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's my pleasure to introduce her. Dr. Holtkrantz is a board-certified hematologist who specializes in the treatment of multiple myeloma and other related plasma cell disorders. She is focused on further optimizing treatment strategies for people with multiple myeloma and offers a variety of modern treatments, including clinical trials and novel immunotherapies. She is also working on measures to continue to improve patients' quality of life while receiving treatment for multiple myeloma. In 2015, Dr. Holkrantz received the Research Fellow Award from the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and the International Postdoc Award from the Swedish Research Council. Dr. Holkrantz is fluent in Swedish and English, and I am just so excited to hear from you today, Dr. Holkrantz. It's your time now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you for having me back. I'm also as excited as, as Ardu to, to be here. So let's get started. There. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is we are going to talk about multiple myeloma and this is uh, immunotherapy 101. So let me see. Here, multiple myeloma and immunotherapy. We're going to touch briefly on what is the immune system, what is immunotherapy, the different types of immunotherapy, and then um, the future, st future strategies and how this fits into where we are with treatment. So uh, what is the immune system? If you look at the National Cancer Institute, the immune system and kind of the textbooks, is a complex network of cells, tissues, organs, and the substances they make that helps the body fight infections and other diseases, that meaning cancer included. The immune system include white, white blood cells and organs and tissues of the lymph node, such as the spleen, lymph nodes, and the bone marrow. Let me see if I can move here. So continuing on the immune system, some of our immune fighters, they are the lymphocytes. So we have different types of lymphocytes. We have B and T lymphocytes. Uh, we have the natural killer cells. We have the cytotoxic T cells. We have the B cells. These are the ones that make the antibodies. And these are the ones that in normally they mature also into the plasma cells. We have like regulatory T cells and we have the CD4 helper T cells. We're going to focus on a few of these uh, during this presentation. So during the tumor immunology, uh, what we see or what we want to see is that all these different types of lymphocytes, they help fight the tumor. But what we also do see in multiple myeloma and a lot of different other types of cancers is that there is a T cell dysfunction and eventually in T cell exhaustion. So due to the chronic stimulation, these kind of get tired and they get exhausted and they don't work as well. So their effect goes down, they, they don't proliferate, so they don't um, divide as effectively, and really they don't work as effectively to fight the cancer cells. We're seeing starting this, we think that this starts already actually in the MGUS phase. So what happens is that the malignant plasma cells, the myeloma cells, they kind of escape, they evade the immune system. So they find ways of hiding, and also doing to, to this T cell exhaustion, it's an interplay here with the exhausted T cells that don't recognize the myeloma cells and the myeloma cells also kind of um, then um, 
they, they kind of like this this T cell exhaustion as well. So they have ways of, of uh, maintaining this as well. So they do want to hide. But the good thing is that these T cells, they can still be stimulated to effectively fight multiple myeloma. And we're gonna see that later. So what is immunotherapy? The American Cancer Society says that the immuno immunotherapy is treatment that uses a person's own immune system to fight cancer. This can be done in several ways. Immune therapy, immunotherapy can boost or change how the immune system works so it can fight and attack cancer cells. So it can work smarter or harder to fight the cancer cells. Also, it can be helped by making substances in the lab that are just like immune system components. And by using them, we can help restore or improve how the immune system works to fight the cancer cells. So how is this different from chemotherapy? Chemotherapy, and it goes in, and this is kind of the traditional chemotherapy um, that, that we sometimes use for multiple myeloma as well, but these are the, really the traditional ones that were invented many, many years ago. So these really, in, they go into the cell and they interfere with different types of cell functions. So they can inhibit DNA synthesis, they can damage the DNA, they can interfere with cell function and they can interfere with cell division. So they really come from the outside, they go in and they interfere, they damage things in, in the cell so it can't divide and it can't function and then it dies. So immunotherapy, on the other hand, it really works with the immune system. So it does work, it, it uses the immune system in different ways to, as mentioned before, help to fight the cancer cells in different ways. So the different types of immunotherapy that we have, they're monoclonal antibodies, immunomodulatory drugs, antibody drug conjugates. We have the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, or the CAR T cells, we have the bispecific antibodies, we have checkpoint inhibitors, and then we have cancer vaccines. So we're going to go through all of these. So for the monoclonal antibodies, these have been around for some time now. These are, uh, are the first type, they're what we call naked antibodies. So they have, they're an antibody that look like a Y, and they have, they bind to the myeloma cell. So this is daratumumab, it binds to CD38, which is a protein on the myeloma cell. And it does have both indirect and direct effects. So it can have a cross-linking effect leading to an, a direct killing. And the indirect effects are that they, it recruits the immune system and in different ways uses different cells to recruit them and then to kill the myeloma cell. The ones that we use are daratumumab, isotuximab, and elotuzumab. Sorry, the immunomodulatory drugs, these uh, have different types of effects. These are the IMIDs, these are the ones that we use a lot, also for multiple myeloma, the lenalidomide, promalidomide, and thalidomide. And then the new version, uh, which has a slightly different or slightly enhanced effect, we think, and also has um, maybe a little bit more of the immunomodulatory effects are the cell mods. So these work through a protein called cerevlon. They get into the cell, and the, one of the main effects is that it helps to degrade. So it helps to, you know, um, it targets different proteins in the cells, and then these get degraded, and the, the myeloma cells, they can't function out without these proteins. So when these, the, these are essential to the myeloma cell, and without them, then the myeloma cell dies. The other thing is that it also does, these, they also do have, immunomodulatory effects. So they can activate T cells, they can activate NK cells, they can affect the uh, building of blood vessels and so on. So they have a number of other um, effects on the immune system as well. Next class is the antibody drug conjugates. The one that we have here that's FDA approved is belantamab mephidotin or Blenrep. This one targets BCMA or B cell maturation antigen on the myeloma cells. So what this is, this is a kind of a combination of an immunotherapy and a, a, a chemo. So it is an antibody that does bind to the myeloma cells. So you see this here, and it does also affect the, it also does recruit the, the immune system. But these little things here on the side of the antibody, these are small chemo agents. So what it does is that it delivers, it binds to the myeloma cell, gets taken into the myeloma cell, then it releases these chemo agents, and this has an effective killing of the myeloma cell. So it's really a targeted kind of chemo delivery as well. 
The overall response rate here is around 32%. And these are also, this study was done in patients that have gone through several lines of therapy, so four or more lines of therapy. The median progression free survival was 11 months. The main side effects here are eye side effects, so ocular side effects, up to 70% of patients in this study uh, experience that. These can be dry eye or blurry vision. We also see some thrombocytopenia, so low platelets. So with these eye side effects, um, the way that this drug is approved is that you need to see an eye doctor before each dose. And by doing that, we can actually manage these eye side effects pretty effectively. So if we see that there are small changes or we see that there is um, and there are no changes or small changes, we can continue with the dosing. And if there are more, if there is a higher grade of these changes, we can reduce the dose or we can delay the dose. So we can manage this pretty effectively. The next class, and we're going to spend a little bit more on time on this, these are the chimeric uh, antigen receptor T cells, so the CAR T cells. These are human T cells that have been modified and then grown in the laboratory and then given back to the patient to target the tumor. So how this works is that first, the, the, we collect or harvest the T cells from the patient. We take them into the lab. We give them a new gene with uh, to codes for this new receptor. And that's called, this receptor is called the chimeric antigen receptor. So that's the CAR. So we give them this new receptor and then we grow them and then we give them back to the patient. So they're small you know, missile cells that then come back into the patient and very effectively kill this cancer cells. This is uh, considered a one-time treatment. So it's kind of a one and done. And we see very durable responses also after these uh, treatments. The one thing is that this also this whole process, it can take up to six, eight weeks. So often we have to give something, some treatment, maybe before, sometimes in between as well, to you know, bridge that, that time from the when we harvest the T cells until we can give them back. So there are different targets, so different proteins on the myeloma cells that we can target with these cells. So the main one is BCMA, again, B cell maturation antigen. Here we have two different CAR T cells that have been approved. One is a BECMA or IDA cell. Second one is CARVICTI or STELTA cell. The third one that we have also at MSK is something called ORVA cell. But there are a number of different uh, BCMA CAR targeted uh, CAR T cells. Another one, another target is GPRC5D. And a colleague of mine, Dr. Melan Cody, just published this in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. So we see very high, we're very good results also with, with um, this with this target. And it's a different target. So even those that have gone through a BCMA targeted treatment, they can actually respond to, to CAR T with BCMA, but they can also respond. Um, um, it might be more attractive sometimes to, to give a treatment for a different targeting a different targets and there the GPRC5D is very appealing as well. The third uh, type here or another different type is what we call allogeneic. So these are CAR T cells from someone else, not from the patient itself. So these are, we can use and we can use them, they're called off the shelf. So we can, I'm kind of almost ready to use. Most of them are targeting BCMA as well. And this, the, the advantage here is that we don't have to go through that six to eight week of the production process. So this is, I'm going to show quickly results for one of the CAR T cells. This is for CARVICTI or CELTA cell. These are really effect, these are really high results rates. So the overall response rate, that means that this is a group, this group's everyone that has a partial response or better. And partial response means that the M spike goes down by 50% or more. So depending on which CAR T cell it is and which patient group, almost more the patient group, you kind know, of how many lines of therapy, how refractory they are, then this is effective in around 70, up to almost 100% of patients. For this one, this is the SILTA cell trial. We see that the overall response rate was 98%. 
80% of patients went into or had a complete response, meaning that the M-spike or the light chains go back to normal, M-spike goes back to zero. Almost 95% had a very good partial response, and that means that the M-spike goes down by 90% or more. So these are really good results. We also see that these are very durable responses. This trial, after two years, the majority of patients were still in remission without any maintenance therapy. So very exciting. The one thing though, with all of these CAR T cells, Ida cell, cell to cell, and um, I think the, the ones that are approved, is that there is an, an issue with availability. So there are some production, you know, if they, they, unfortunately they can't produce unlimited number of cells for unlimited number of patients. So we have to, uh, at this point, we have to prioritize a little bit who needs it most. And that's a very tricky process, but but uh, going forward, hopefully the, the production will go up and uh, we will have these, uh, we will have a lot more availability. The CAR-T side effects, um, these are cytokine release syndrome. And this means that the body kind of sets off, it's kind of like a bit of a cytokine um, almost storm. Um, so uh, this can cause fever, can cause shortness of breath, low oxygen, headache, elevated heart rate, low blood pressure, rash. And this is seen in any grade up to almost 80% of patients. We treat this with fluids, with steroids, with uh, IL-6 blocking agents. So we kind of try to manage and decrease this um, release and this kind of cytokine storm. And due to this, um, we, most of the trials or most of the time we have the patient admitted. So we go through this time period when you're in the hospital. The other thing that can happen is something called ICANS or immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity. This can affect uh, aphasia, so talking, it can affect uh, the mental status, you can be confused. Um, compare the cognition, so thinking, the higher function can lead to weakness and seizures. This is not as common, and most of these are reversible, thank you, uh, thankfully. So there's a lot of interest in also developing these different CAR T cells. So we have a lot more uh, new different CAR T cell constructs that help, and the, the main goal of this is to have the CAR T cells work better or work longer, so stay around longer. One thing that we have at MSK is something called a dual CAR T cell trial. So we're giving um, now the BCMA targeted and the GPRC5D targeted at the same time. We're just about to start this, this trial to see if that has an even better and even longer effect. Next topic is the bispecific antibodies, and there's been a lot of uh, interest in this, especially now that the first one has been FDA approved. So the way that these work, these are antibodies, and compared to the naked antibody, which I showed you before, these are they, these are, or that have the, the, the two arms that are targeted to the same kind of molecule, these have two arms that are targeted towards different things. One binds to the myeloma cell and the other one binds to the T cell. And what it really does is that it, it tells the immune system, it tells the T cell that this is the myeloma cell. This is the one that you should attack. And it brings them in very close proximity. So there are different types of these bispecific antibodies. So the some of the first ones that are, um, developed are these bites. So the this is a trademark from one of the companies. And this takes the one part of the top part of this, this antibody here and the top part of the tumor directed antibody here and go together and then it brings these in close proximity. Most of the the anti by specific antibodies that we'll talk about are something called a dual body. So it has the full antibody and it has one arm that is directed to the T cell and the other arm that is directed to the, the plasma cell. So the targets here are similar to those of the CAR T cells. Most of them are BCMA targeted. Teclistamab was the one that was just recently approved. Elranantamab also gotten very far in, in the trials. We have, we have one from Tenio Bio Abvi and then one from Regen Regeneron. 
we have the GPRC 5D targeted, and then we have uh, one also that is targeted towards FCRH5s. And all of these are proteins, molecules that are on the surface of the myeloma cells. These are given intravenously or subcutaneously as a shot. They're given every week or up to every four weeks, depending on which antibody it is and what the dosing schedule is. The overall response rates here are between 60 and 70%. This is also super exciting because these trials also start, the, the first trials that are usually done in, in any kind of um, you know, cancer treatment is that you start out with those that have gone through the, the standard treatments. So these trials are for patients that have gone through four lines of treatments. So they've been through and unfortunately relapsed, but then still can have a very good response from these bispecific antibodies. I'm going to go through a little bit just of ticlistamab, just because this is the one that is approved. So the overall response rate in this trial, this is the phase two trial, was 63%. VGPR or better, almost 60%. Remember that was the, the response where the M spike goes down by 90% or more. CR, almost 40%, so complete response. MRD negative, meaning that we can't see it in the blood and we can't see, we can't detect it in the bone marrow either, was almost 27%, so really good. Median time to response, meaning how quickly you respond, is um, almost after, after a bit over a month. So very quick responses and very durable responses. So in this trial, the, me the duration of response um, had not been reached yet. So people continue to, do, to respond. The side effects from the bispecific antibodies. There is the same uh, risk of, or the similar side effects with the cytokine release syndrome and ICANS as with CAR T cells, but they are lighter. They're not as severe and they're not as um, severe grading. So that's why the way that teclistamab is approved and the way that all the studies are done is that for, there's a step-up dosing where we give a smaller kind of test dose first, and then a few days later, we give a bit higher dose, and then a few days later, we give you know, eventually up to the full dose. So and we do that inpatient to monitor and to be able to treat the cytokine release syndrome. And then after you get through that step-up dosing phase, then everything else can be done as outpatient. So you can come then to get your either IV or you can get your shot to every week or every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks, depending on which uh, antibody it is and what, which dose, dosing schedule it is. The other side effects that we have to, that we've seen with the bispecific antibodies is immunosuppression and infections. So they not only have a very good effect in, in treating the myeloma cells, it does also suppress some of the B and T cells. So we do see quite a bit of infections here. So we're really closely monitoring for infections and we're giving prophylactic um, treatments for to prevent these infections as well. So the, on, the studies that are ongoing with the bispecific antibodies, um, the single agent studies, they're ongoing or almost have been completed for many of these uh, different uh, these different drugs. Now we have also a lot of the combination studies. So for multiple myeloma, um, there is, a, um, as probably many of you know, we do uh, a lot of combination treatments. So we do treat myeloma when and kind of get at the myeloma cell from different uh, from different ways. So we we attack it with different mechanisms of actions. So we're now combining these bispecific antibodies with the imid, so lenalidomide, pomalidomide, with proteasome inhibitors. Um, bortezomib, carifelzomib, daratumumab, we are combining different bispecific antibodies, and then also checkpoint inhibitors, which I'll get to in a second. Actually here. So the checkpoint inhibitors, this is a different type of drug. So the definition is here is that this is an immunotherapy drug called immune checkpoint inhibitors, and they work by blocking the checkpoint proteins from binding to their partner proteins. So this prevents the off signal from being sent, allowing the T cells to kill the cancer cells. So the, this is what happens under under kind of um, with under normal or 
when the tumor cell tries to hide here from the immune system. So you have these different um, bindings here with the PD-1 and PDL one So this is a signal that the tumor cell shows to the, the T cell and it says, hi, I'm a normal cell, don't kill me. So the T cell does not recognize the tumor cell but in, and it kind of, um, the tumor cell can go on uh, with, um, kind of go on with this day. What happens when you have this type of checkpoint inhibitor is you block this link here. So the, the T cell is then allowed to see that the tumor cell is an abnormal cell and should not be there and then activates the killing of this tumor cell. So this is a very smart smart uh, mechanism and this um, the person who invented this um, he won the Nobel Prize for this a few years ago. This works very well for many different cancers, among them melanoma and lung cancer. So checkpoint inhibitors in myeloma has not, we haven't seen unfortunately the same really good effect. So it's been tried for monotherapy. So just by itself, it's been tried with imids, specifically lenalidomide, and these didn't really have a good effect, unfortunately. Now we are testing it with bispecific antibodies, uh, and we have a trial open also at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So we're, we're hoping that these two together will work well. Cancer vaccines, I'll touch briefly on. And these are a form of immuno immunotherapy where, where you help and you educate the immune system what the cancer cell look like so it can recognize it and then eliminate it. So it's similar to when you have a vaccine towards um, you know, any kind of virus or bacteria. So, and you can make these actually personal. So you can take the, the body, the person's specific tumor and you can make a tumor vaccine with the specific antigen. So with the specific things that are shown on the tumor cell surface, and you give it back, and then you then you help the immune system, educate the immune system. This is what the tumor looks like, and this is what you should attack. And then uh, the immune system should recognize this, and then cause the immune the the myeloma cells to to uh, to die. The, this has, we're still kind of, they, there's a lot of studies ongoing with this, and they've been studying both in, in early precursor or with the smoldering, and then also after transplant. Uh, we're still waiting on a big breakthrough for, for this, but um, there's still a lot ongoing here. So in summary, um, we do have a lot of different new drugs and a lot of different ways of using the immune system. And we can, as I said in the beginning, we can still you know, wake up the immune system and uh, educate and help the T cells to recognize and then effectively kill the myeloma cells. The ones that we're mostly excited about are the CAR T cells and the bispecific antibodies. Um, so this is kind of a general approach of what uh, we do now in multiple myeloma. So we have the induction, you have a proteasome inhibitor, Velcade or carfilzomib, you have an image, so usually lenalidomide, and then uh, usually combined with uh, anti-CD8 anti um, antibodies, so daratumumab or isotuximab. So you have your induction, and you have a transplant, and then you have the maintenance, and then in early relapse, you kind of use some of the similar drugs or different combinations or different drugs, but kind of in the same drug class. And usually these work still very well. And then in later relapses, if the disease still comes back, that's where we have the trials and the approvals now for the bispecific antibodies, the CAR T cells, and other different types of therapies. So what's going to happen in the next couple of years or next five, 10 years is that we're likely going to see induction therapies in that include bispecific antibodies. We may not, we might do CAR T cells instead of, of uh, transplant here. And there are actually studies starting to compare these two different treatments already now. For maintenance, we can use different by specific antibodies. We can have targeted therapies. Is this where we're going to use the cell mods? And then for when we use all these very effective drugs up front, um, the, the relapses will hopefully, if they come, will hopefully come much later, if maybe at all. And what we're going to do at that point, that's still a very open question, but, but I think we're going to see a lot 
a lot more uh, deeper responses and longer responses when we move these uh, treatments up in earlier lines. So in summary, uh, immunotherapy for multiple myeloma is highly effective. Some of the most exciting things are the CAR T cells and the bispecific antibodies. And as I mentioned, this will be used more and more and in earlier lines of therapy. With that, thank you very much. I'm um, really excited to be back here and I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you again for inviting me back. Yay, thank you. That was such an excellent presentation. I think you went through a lot of complicated things in a really efficient manner. So thank you. That is your strong point and that's why you were invited back. So thank you. Um, well, that's one of the reasons you're invited back. <laughs> There's lots of great questions um, in the box already. I'm going to go through and let's start actually with this question. Do you ever see immunotherapy reaching high-risk smoldering myeloma patients? Um, or is that something in the works of clinical trials? Or is it more of the wait and watch kind of thing? Mm, wait just a second. That's fine. I think that's a that's a really good question. And that's some of the things that we are really discussing at the at the moment. Um, high risk smoldering, I think, should be treated in the setting of clinical trials. Um, but um, I do think that uh, we should be exploring a lot of clinical trials in the high risk smoldering because it is um, it it really is a questionable kind of how long you can you can stay in that stage. Should you should you call it early myeloma and start treatment, or should you kind of wait and watch? It's a lot of the, that discussion we usually have with each and every patient, and a lot of patients are asking this question: should we should we not treat earlier and kind of um, have um, have a better response or potentially better response. Um, I think, um, as I said, high-risk smoldering, I think, should be treated in the in the clinical, clinical trial setting. We don't really treat that much smoldering outside of the clinical trial setting, so it's much better to study it and see kind of what are we doing and what should we be doing. I certainly think that in a couple of years, we're going to see the bispecific antibodies already in smoldering. We're actually discussing a, a few of those, those concepts as well. So that is something that is, is in the works. Uh, how exciting. Do you see vaccines being used um, in precursor myeloma? Uh, it has been studied. I think it's a really interesting concept. Um, we haven't seen, as I said, we haven't really seen a, a big kind of breakthrough in that yeah. just yet. I think theoretically, I think it's a great idea. And I think it's a really interesting, it, it's a but we still have to to make it work a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say. Yeah, we have to watch and wait. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Let's talk more about moving from precursor to newly diagnosed frontline therapy. Mm -hmm. We have Darzalex that is now the standard of care. Mm -hmm. Combining DARA with RVD is now the new standard of care, mm -hmm. although it's not being used in oncology mm -hmm. settings um, in the local clinics, which I feel like that's one of my missions of 2023 is to help get that out there so yeah, that yeah. newly diagnosed patients can have better uh, frontline therapy. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about CAR T. By specifics, do you ever see these becoming frontline therapy for newly diagnosed? And if so, uh, absolutely. I, I think that in in so first of all, I 100% agree with you. I think that um, I I think that um, Dara VRD is an excellent frontline therapy. I also don't think that we should should um, uh, forget about KRD or even for yeah. some of the high risk. Even think about Dara KRD. Uh, but I think that um, um, certainly we should be moving to more effective therapies than than VRT. <laughs> yeah. I 100% agree with you uh, on that and uh, happy to discuss that with anyone who has uh, questions. <laughs> um, so um, the, in, for, so the way that that um, cancer drugs and myeloma drugs are you know, developed, it's, we usually, so all the studies, they, they usually start in those that have gone through the standard therapies. So usually now the ways that, that the trials are written is that you have to, or a lot of these, these uh, trials for the relapsed refractory and also the approvals, the FDA approvals in the label they have, you have to say that you have to have gone through four lines of therapy before you can have this. Mm -hmm. This is also something that we want to, to kind of discuss because 
that traditional four lines of therapy that would include that you would have, you know, the different combinations of the, the proteasome inhibitors and then darcelics and then, you know, so now if you, if you have the, say, around the five different uh, drugs that we use a lot, or if you take the drug classes of the proteasome inhibitors, the IMIDs and the CD, anti-CD38 antibodies, if you use them in different combinations, now you're going to do that in two lines instead of if we use four of them up front. So by two lines, you've, you've almost gotten to that point where you would want to have something new. So, so this is also something that's being discussed, how we design the different trials. But um, going forward, I think that these are just the way that carfilzomib or that uh, daratumumab or lenalidomide, all of these were you know, first tried out in the relapse setting. And then when we see that they work and they're safe, we move them up to earlier and earlier lines. And then also we move them to the smoldering setting. So as we get more data on these and as we see that they work and they're safe, which I hope we don't, I mean, the, everything has side effects, but, but this is what we're expecting to, to see. Um, that we can move them up earlier and we can use the more effective drugs uh, in earlier and earlier, earlier lines. But of course, we have to, we have to do this because we don't really want to jump through any of these stages either. We want to, you really need to go through the different stages of the trial. So you have to do the phase one, you have to do the phase two, and then the FDA approval, if it shows efficacy and safety, then it gets approved somewhere after phase two or phase phase three. So you really have to do go through those both to see that they're effective and also to look at all the safety signals. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna, even, even though we have very high hopes, we don't really wanna jump over any of these steps because we wanna make sure that everything is safe. Yeah. So, but as we do this, what we expect is that we'll see all of these being used in much earlier. And I think that uh, transplant, I think, is a very good treatment for multiple myeloma, but it is going to be challenged with the, the CAR-T. For sure. Yeah, let's talk about that a little more because there's questions about that. Do you see personally, right, because every myeloma specialist seems to have yeah. a different opinion on this, but do you see CAR-T as replacing stem cell therapy, um, being in tandem with stem cell therapy. And then there was another question about if stem cell or if cells are harvested in the same way mm -hmm. um, for stem cell transplant as CAR-T. So if we want to hit on that a little bit. So uh, I think it's certainly going to be challenged. Uh, and I think we, we do have already, these are two very good treatments. So I don't think the transplant is going to go away. And we really, as I said, with the safety and efficacy, we really have to do the trial and see you know, which one is best. Um, and it having one that may be better than the other doesn't mean that the other one is going to go away. You, as you said, you can use them in tandem. And we have actually trials where we do in the relapse setting where we do a stem cell, usually a, 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 that means there's usually a second transplant leading into the CAR-T. Yeah. Um, so, and in that setting, we sometimes, we have the possibility of har harvesting the, 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 at the same time. Um, right now, it is very hard to, um, it's very hard to, to harvest the T cells and to store them because there are a number both practical and then kind of storage is issues. I mean, but even if we would overcome the storage is issues and kind of um, all the practical logistical things about that, the T cells, um, they work better if they're fresh when we start, um, when we start kind of working with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know if they're gonna work, but maybe not as well if you have them stored for or frozen um, and then try to use them again. So, so we really want the, the fresh uh, T cells uh, the way that we, we do it right now. This is also, might hopefully change it, but but this is really how we do it now. So we we uh, for practical reasons and for kind of the effect and the outcome, we do want the fresh cells. Yeah, and is it through apheresis like stem cell, or is yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a little. It's a one day procedure uh, for the um, for the CAR T. So um, it's slightly easier. It's the same thing. You need to have a, the, the line usually, and then uh, it's an aphoresis, but um, it's not, it doesn't take as, as much time. So it's usually one day just only. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's keep talking about CAR-T if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, We talked about the delay that's significantly impacting the availability. Do you see that this ever resolves? I mean, (laughs) that seems like a silly question, right? Do you see it resolving itself? And do you see aloe as, I mean, we talked a little bit about aloe maybe being the solution to this. Give me a little bit more of your thoughts on that. So I think this can be, um, there are lots of talk about how we can overcome this. And, and part of it is now is that the production is done in the central lab through the companies okay, on, for, on, the, on the commercial side. On the research side, uh, at least at Memorial Stone Kettering, we do like the, the cells are produced at Stone Kettering. So you don't have to go, it, it, it's quicker. Oh, it still great. takes a few weeks, not six to eight weeks, but it still takes a few weeks, that whole process. Um, so I think for, and there is kind of discussions on should every hospital or the bigger hospital kind of have a car lab on site? How do we make sure that the, the quality is good? How do we make sure it's the same product and that everyone gets? There's a lot of practical issues mm-hmm. uh, that I don't think are really resolved yet, but that is might be one of the things that you can have a, a local lab in, 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 in one in every area. And then um, that is approved and that is, you know, FDA inspected and, and all of those things to make sure that it, that the, it is the same quality everywhere. These things are yet to be resolved. Um, but the way that it's done right now, uh, I think we can get that cut down a little bit on it, but I think it's going to it's going to be harder to hard to do less than like four weeks or so. Yeah. And what do we know about allocart Is it as effective and are is the um, graft versus host disease a problem with allocart Um so th- these are excellent questions. <laughs> really good Thank questions. You. Um so for the uh, it's as I said, it's kind of off the shelf, so you can you can you can use them directly. Uh, they seem to be as effective. They're not the. It's still the reports are still from very early trials. There we haven't done as many or as big trials as for for the other CAR Ts. Um, we might see a little bit more infection, so I think it might have a bit more effect on the immune system. Um, graft versus host. A lot of these are actually modified, so the so they're kind of manipulated to not give very much graft versus host, but. But it seems that they might have a bit more infection, so so it's it's a bit more foreign than than your, your own CAR T. Yeah, let's talk about infection because that's the one cap. Well, I'm using very broad statements here, but I feel like it's one of the biggest caveats of immunotherapy. Is mm-hmm. wow, now we're at higher risk for infection, which is the leading cause of death in multiple myeloma mm-hmm. patients. You know, it seems like it's it's a risk because it's the exact opposite of what we want. And yet it's helping kill the myeloma. So what do you advise your patients? Like, is it the older frail ones that you watch for and say, you know, maybe this isn't for you, or are there things being done to um, not kill those B and T cells? You know what I mean? Like what's being done when it comes to this? So, um, Unfortunately, we don't really have a way of saying, oh, we'll, we'll just target these ones and kind of have the healthy or normal and, and so on. Um, that would be a great solution to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're doing now is really monitoring for each patient um, that are on trials. Um, what, as much as we, it, the immune system is very hard to measure because the immune system is so complex and there's so many cells and so many different molecules and antibodies and so on involved. Um, so what we can do is to, we can measure the different B and T cells and we can measure the subsets and we can get an idea of what is the immune suppression. Is there immune suppression and kind of how much in every in each and every patient? And then we can start giving immune the prophylactic so we can give prophylaxis towards different viruses and that that's one of the signals that we've seen we have seen some viral infections with in some of these patients so we can give um prophylactic medications then we can give prophylactic medications also against uh pneumocystis the pneumonia so there are a number of these that uh some of like the infections that we tend to see in immunocompromised patients there are a lot of them with, that we can prevent and we can monitor and prevent that's kind of the the strategy that we have right now 
That's encouraging, I think, because mm -hmm. I know it's a big worry of, of people going into it. Um, one of the questions here I thought was really intriguing. Mike's wondering if diet and nutrition play a complementary role with immunotherapy. Yes, um, and I would encourage you to, uh, I think it was Dr. Lasokin who had the gut microbiome uh, um, <laughs> therapy as well. So I didn't touch very much on that, but it does for sure play and an, um, it does for sure uh, inter um, have an interplay for sure. So, uh, and there's a lot of a colleague of mine, Dr. Shaw, she's doing also some nutritional studies in early disease and we do see that it can affect these are still very early studies so so there's a lot more that that we want to know but we know that the gut microbiota so the different bacteria that you have in the gut everyone has a lot of bacteria in, in the stomach so which type and the the diversity there really impacts also how it can affect um in in other diseases, it has been just studied for graft versus host disease, for instance. And it can even impact kind of how you respond or how it, so there's a lot more there that we want to, that we want to know. And what you eat affects which bacteria you have. So yes, indirectly, what you eat affects your metabolism. It affects, um, of course, if you have any deficiencies, it can affect the blood counts. Um, but, and then also with the, the, uh, with the gut microbiota, the different types of bacteria you have, and that affects also in the endpoint, how you respond. And that might be a little bit of overstatement, but it can affect kind of how you do on therapies and, uh, especially graft versus host, but, um, look at Alex's, uh, talk there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make sure to send that out. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Lishokin gave a microbiome 101. So lots of 101 crash courses yeah. over here. Um, on a very basic level, I would say that uh, eating healthy and, and participating in active fitness, active movement lowers comorbidities and lowers risks, which qualifies you for more immunotherapy. Absolutely. Treatments, right. And so even to that very basic extent of mm -hmm. you are doing yourself a favor by a qualifying for the treatment and B having a better response to the treatment, possibly because you put in all this work and don't have hypertension and don't have diabetes type two and things like that. So, yep. And that I don't think we can emphasize enough for all different stages from MGUS to, to small drink, newly diagnosed to relapse, how you eat, if you eat like, um, healthy nutritional diet, lots of fruits, vegetables, and uh, fibers, and exercise both affect how you're doing in your physical body and your mental status as well. Mm -hmm. So this is really one of the big things that we I want to encourage everyone to, to do. Look at your diet and look at your exercise and then sleeping patterns uh, as well. But that tends to come as a secondary effect as well. Yeah. Yeah. And also difficult on those dex days. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Okay. Lots of other great questions. The one that I want to hit next is from Tobias and he's asks, why is myeloma so difficult to treat? I'll expand on that just a little bit. Myeloma mm -hmm. is so smart. Unfortunately, it's such a smart disease and it makes me mad mm -hmm. that it's, so, it's able to trick these um, natural, you know, killing cells. It also, you know, let's talk a little bit more about why um, with Dr. Jim, the Allison's uh, in checkpoint inhibitors, mm -hmm. it works well in tumors, but myeloma, because it's with the blood, because it's with the bone marrow, I mean, that's essentially why it's not working as well. So why is myeloma so difficult to treat? <laughs> uh, yes, I would wish I would have a great answer to, to that. But it is really a, a, a disease that is, as you said, it is pretty smart, unfortunately. And it has both, it is an immune cell. So it kind of knows also how to evade the immune system. It knows how to hide and it knows how to you know, send out signals that signals to the immune system and say like, hey, don't, don't look at me. Don't, I'm not here kind of thing. Um, and then also, as I said, it affects the T regulatory uh, cells and it affects the, the, like on the T cell as a whole, it, 
they become exhausted in a way. So they don't recognize the, the either amgos or smoldering or myeloma cells. And so the myeloma cell has a way of kind of creating this little micro environment around itself where it kind of hides and, and uh, gets away, evades from, from the immune system. So that's one thing. The other thing is that it has ways um, of like inside of the cell, there's an ongoing evolution of the, the mutations. So myeloma diagnosis, we know that there are a number of different cell clones. It's not only one disease. So if you treat, you might treat, say, if I'm, I think there's on average eight to 10 clones or something. If you treat and it has a very good effect, it, it kills eight clones, but then you have the two clones that are a little bit more resistant and those are the ones that are going to grow out. And then if the disease comes back, it's going to hire, ha have higher, um, higher percentage of those that are those cells that are a little bit more resistant. So as you treat, it's going to get more and more kind of resistant to the therapies that you give. But one other thing is that there is, has been shown to have these like clonal types. So these clones, they like come and go a little bit. So that's why we can also reuse these treatments. So if you have one treatment and then um, the disease goes down and then it starts coming up, you want to change treatment and, and give it something else. But then if, it, if it comes back again, you can sort of use, if you had a good response in the beginning, you can use those drugs again. Um, so there it's, it's a little, it's different. The, the percentage of these different clones vary a little bit when at the different times that it, it tends to come back. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, um, there are other ways of getting away from the immune system is, or for, from the treatments is that some of these things that we have on the cell surface, the, the myeloma cells can find ways of getting rid of them. So if you have something that targets um, BCMA or so, the, the, there is actually a little enzyme on just there that cuts off BCMA from the cell surface. So then the BCMA drugs are not going to use, uh, they're not going to work as well. So there are actually studies ongoing, and we have one at MSK, where you combine a BCMA-targeted drug with an inhibitor of that specific enzyme. So if you inhibit that enzyme that cuts off BCMA, you're going to have more BCMA on the cell surface, so the BCMA drugs can work better. So yes, the, the tumor cells are very smart in very different ways, um, but we're catching up. That's why I'm thinking as well. Wait, Audrey, I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. I, I was just going to say, I think that's the mir the miracle, I'll use that word, of myeloma right now, the myeloma field, is yes, this disease is super smart, but the amazing research that's being done, thank you, Dr. Holkrans, thank you to your team, because there's so much hope in the myeloma field right now. I mean, we just spent an hour talking about these immunotherapies that are having amazing results in very refractory myeloma. I mean, yes, it's smart, but I really believe that you and myeloma scientists are smarter and we are finding ways to treat it. It's highly treatable, maybe not curable right now, but I'm confident. I mean, in the amazing research that's been done, the amazing products that we have now to treat myeloma, I mean, it is incredibly difficult to treat, but thank you for all you're doing and how exciting it is that it is highly treatable right now and continues to improve literally every day um, in the myeloma field. Just even hearing about those clinical trials that you and your team are working on is just so hopeful. And so uh, thank you. Thank you so much for what well, you're doing. Well, thank you for all you're doing and kind of educating everyone uh, as well. This is a super important uh, task. And I do 100% agree that these are very exciting times. So um, I think we're going to, uh, with these new drugs and with all the different types of new drugs with different combinations and different ways we can use them and use them in sequence, I think we're going to see very different and much better outcomes from each and every treatment, but also kind of over time. So I think we're going to see a lot of improvement over, 
over the next years. So thank you uh, to you, everyone. I think it's great that there's so many people are here and to to wanting to to be educated about this and to wanting to engage. And I do encourage uh, everyone clinical trials. We have a lot of clinical trials. Clinical trials are of um very good and that's the way that it's it is really a resource to get access to new drugs and also to to help all of these things move forward so so um if you have a chance and and um if you're offered i i would certainly consider that as well yeah yeah thank you so much i really appreciate you dr holkerns and thank you to our audience for taking the time today i know there were many questions we didn't get to but i really do appreciate the questions asked and the participation here it just brings me so much joy thank you dr holkerns thank you so um to our audience as you leave the session today we would appreciate you taking two to three minutes to fill out a brief survey about your experience what did you like today what can we do better? And what are your future topic suggestions? As I love to hear from you what you want to learn about. And then you can join us in January as we're going to go more in depth about CAR T, discuss what's available, for whom, and what the future might bring when it comes to CAR T. You can also participate in our upcoming events. Uh, tonight at 6 30 p.m. is our Florida chapter. We're going to be discussing side effects when they need a second look and how to manage them. The 16th at 1 p.m. Mountain is our Mountain West regional chapter. We're going to be discussing how fitness affects the Mountain West myeloma community. And then the 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern is our Black Myeloma Health chapter. We're going to be discussing how to give and receive care when on the myeloma journey. Another thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Genentech, AbbVie, and Amgen. And thank you to each of you again for taking the time to be here and helping us build the strong myeloma community. I really appreciate you. Hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.